Have you ever had this experience? You pick up the phone, you've got to call customer service, and you hear this message. Hi, thank you for calling. Your hold time is 52 minutes to talk to someone from customer service. And that's after you have talked to a robot for like 15 minutes, pressing zero, 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 agent, 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 and finally it says, okay, we're happy to transfer you to an agent. Tell us what you want to talk about. Press one for, and you just like want to pull your hair out and go nuts, because you're like, I don't want to wait 52 minutes to talk to someone. Now I hear some of you are right now saying, Dave, I would never, ever want to talk to a real person on the phone. You use the chat feature, Dave. Come on. Okay, and fair enough. That fair enough. But sometimes you just got to talk to a person. And sometimes you just got to wait. And I don't wait well. I hate it. Especially at an airport. I don't wait well for airplanes or in a traffic jam. One time we got stuck on an interstate somewhere in Arizona because a, hay, uh, a whole rack of hay caught on fire from the heat of the desert and blocked the, the road for like four hours. We sat in 105 degree heat on the interstate and I was going nuts. I don't wait well because when you're waiting, it means it's not going according to your plan or to my plan. And I have a plan. Uh, traveling overseas, you know, I go once a year and usually this is an exercise in waiting for me because, you know, I've got a plan. I get on the plane, I transfer to another plane, I connect to another plane somewhere in Europe, and then I finally get halfway across the world. And I have to remind myself every time, Dave, calm down. Uh, if the plane leaves 30 minutes late, it's okay. You got a layover in Europe somewhere. Or if you miss a plane, it's okay. It's a really long layover. You're gonna have to wait somewhere. But I just hate waiting. I don't do well. I wait poorly. As a Christian... I'm wondering if the same is true for you. I mean, maybe not so much waiting for an airplane or waiting on hold, but waiting for Jesus to come back. You see, if we wait, we can wait well or we can wait poorly. You can wait in anticipation or you can wait with anxiety. There's one verse today in Hebrews that really sets the tone for our passage, and it's actually not in our passage today. It's one verse before our passage. It's the end of the passage I preached last week, but it sets the tone for what I want to talk about today. And the verse is this, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Jesus will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. I'm wondering, how are you waiting? Are you waiting well? Or are you waiting poorly? Because if you wait well, or if you wait poorly, either way, the author of Hebrews has something to say to you. When we wait well, we remember that God has already made us holy. That's the one thing like, I want you to take. If you wait well, you do so because you remember that God has already made you holy. You're thinking, how does that all connect? Well, I'm glad you asked, because we're going to see this in Hebrews chapter 10. Now, some of you in this room today, if you're honest, you just aren't waiting well. You're just not. You're not waiting well. You either don't look forward to Christ's return, or Christ's return isn't even on your mind. You're like, I don't even think about Jesus could come back at any moment. Like, I don't even think about it. You're just wasting your days because you don't know who you really are in Christ nor what you're supposed to be doing while you're waiting. And the fact is, if you know who you are, it can transform every single day you wait for Jesus in eager anticipation. All you gotta do is know who you are really are. And if you do that, it will transform it. How you wait, how you view every day, how you view every moment. When we wait well, we remember that God has already made us holy. All right, we're in Hebrews. We've been in here for a very long time. And uh, I just remind you every week, and if you're visiting here today, I'm glad you're here. I'll bring you up to speed real quick. 
Hebrews is a letter or really a, ser a sermon written to a bunch of Jewish Christians living in Rome at the end of the first century. It's about 30 years after Jesus had risen from the dead and ascended into heaven. And these Jews who had become Christians are like tired of it. Like this is hard. They're facing persecution. And they're just like, let's just go back to being just plain old Jews. Let's just go backwards. And the author of Hebrews is imploring them, don't do it. Don't go backwards. And so in today's text, he has now, he's brought up the idea of we're waiting for Christ's return. And now he's going to say, uh, I know you have to wait. Don't go backwards. Wait well. Wait in anticipation. And really the word waiting appears twice. It's one in verse 28 of last week that we already read. And then if you look at chapter 10, verse 13, they're going to talk about, the author is going to talk about how Jesus waits. He says, Jesus is waiting for that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. So if you're waiting in anticipation for Jesus to come back, guess what? He is too. He's also excited about it. And we're all going to look together today in this text about how we wait well. Now I am using, a little caveat here, I'm using the word waiting because the author of Hebrews uses it. But I really don't like this word. I don't like this word, not because of what the author of Hebrews means by it, but because how we commonly understand waiting for Jesus to come back. There is a sense in which many Christians just sort of view this as a holding tank, a doctor's waiting room, where we're just sitting back waiting, doing nothing, just kind of like, okay, life will really start when Jesus comes back. I'm saved. Great. Maybe I can take a few people with me. And other than that, like, I'm just without purpose. And I hate that because that is not a New Testament teaching. The New Testament teaching is that those who are in waiting in eager anticipation for Christ to come back are active and care extensively about other people. It's a, we, in, in our waiting, we should be externally focused, not just consumed with self. And yet, the author of Hebrews says when you wait, you need to look inside yourself and know who you are. And so he's kind of slapping me around a little bit and saying, Dave, you know what? Like, your whole focus on external stuff while you're waiting, like, there is some internal stuff that needs to happen, too. That's what he's going to talk about today. So how should you wait for Jesus to come back? Today I got four things from the text. The first one is the wrong way to wait. And the last three are the right way to wait. And so let's look in and dive into the text together. I want to know how are you waiting? Are you waiting as one who is stuck in guilt? This is the wrong way to wait. But the author of Hebrews is asking us this question are you waiting as one who is stuck in guilt? Let's look at the text. And I actually just want to pick it up in the verse I already read in verse 28 at the end of chapter 9. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of the realities, it can never, by the sacrifices that are continually offered every year, it can never make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. All right, let's just stop for a second and digest these four or five verses because there's a lot going on in this text. The first thing we see is that he's going to reference the old system, the old law. He's talking about the shadow and the true things. He says the shadows of the things that used to be. And he's building off of what he's been talking about for the last five or six chapters, namely how Jesus is a better priest. The priests that are, the Jewish priests that were operating in the temple the time this letter or the sermon is being written, those were operating, he says, in a shadow. 
that, that the temple on earth, the tabernacle on earth is a shadow of the real one in heaven and where Jesus is ministering in the real one. And now he refers to the old covenant, the way it used to be for the, in the Old Testament. He, that's all, that whole thing's a shadow of the true things, which is the new covenant that we have instituted in Christ. And so he's, he's just rehashing what he's already said. And he says that old system, that shadow, verse 1, it can never make perfect those who draw near. If the old sacrifices worked, he says, eventually they would have gone away. He says, would they not have ceased in verse 2? Well, why? Well, think about this. If the old system where the priest brought an animal and slaughtered the animal on the altar and took the blood and sprinkled the blood for the purifications of the sins of the people, if that worked, wouldn't eventually everyone go through the temple, go through the system? If it worked, wouldn't they all have be like, okay, I did it, it's done, we have no need, and the system would go away because everyone got covered. And he said, but it never goes away. It's just always there repeating more and more blood, more and more animals. You're just stuck. If it worked, they would have stopped. And he says, the problem here, in, and in verse 2, he highlights this. He says, the problem is, is that it can never perfect those who draw near. And then in verse 2, they would no longer have any consciousness or awareness of sin. He said, basically, if it worked, you'd go, oh, my sins are covered. They're wiped clean. I wouldn't even be aware of my sins anymore. Okay, cool. He goes, that doesn't happen at all. Because all y'all are walking around stuck in the guilt of your sins. And he says, you see, verse 4, it's actually impossible for the blood of animals to cover over your sins, to take it away. And this is one of the four impossibles that I've mentioned in Hebrews. One of the four. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away your sins. If you were an Old Testament Israelite, no matter what you did, you could not escape your sin. No matter how hard you tried, it is impossible for these acts of contrition to ever pay for sin. Some of you here today, while you're not an Old Testament Israelite, you can relate to this. Because while you're not trying to slaughter animals, I hope, uh, over and over again, um, while you're not trying to do that to cover over your sins, you are trying to work real hard to pay acts of contrition to make wrongs right. And like, no matter how hard you try, it's impossible. You can never make right all the wrongs you've done. You try to make up for what you've done, but every time you try, it's never enough. You can never escape the guilt of what you've done. Some of you are waiting as those who are stuck in guilt. And the author of Hebrews does not want you to be stuck in guilt. What's the thing you can't escape? Is it your past? Is it a black secret? A sexual sin? A lie? Did you cheat at work or school? Is it a selfish act, a mean act? Is it a sin or attitude or behavior that you just can't undo? And you, or is it just the thing you keep doing over and over and over again and you can never get away from it? And no matter how hard you try to be a better person or no matter how hard you work to offer up an act of contrition, to, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It's impossible for acts of contrition to take away sin. But we do all the things all the time to try to alleviate our guilt. I was recently talking to a group that tends to sponsor short-term, short-term missionaries in places like Africa. And one of the continual problems is when you go as an American to a third world country, you are rich. Like, I mean, they're, they're making like 50 bucks a year, right? So if you have a car, if you have a place to live, and you have $50 in your bank account, you're rich. And most of us have more than that. And you go to this country, and they're not afraid to ask. They just view you as rich, so they're not afraid to ask. And so many Americans go, okay, and they start just indiscriminately handing out money, not because they care about what's happening with the money or is that money actually helping or hurting people, but why do they do it? To alleviate the guilt they feel from being rich. 
And most of the time, just indiscriminately handing out money causes harm to people. It actually hurts them. But you don't really care because you feel guilty and somehow you're alleviating your guilt. Until the next time you go back and then you feel it again and then you ruin something else. Uh, We feel guilt all the time. And whether you know it or not, you're trying to make contrition for your guilt and you can never do enough to make up for the guilt you feel. So I want to know, if you're waiting for Jesus' return, trying to do things that will make up for the guilt you feel, I want to encourage you to stop it. The author of Hebrews says it won't work. That is not how to wait well for Jesus to come back. you got to know who you are. And when we wait well, we remember who we are. We remember that we are holy. And this takes us right into our second point today. Are you waiting as one who has been made holy? These next three are the way you should wait. Look at verse 5. We're going to read 5 through 10 here. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, and now the author is going to quote from Psalm chapter 40, verses 7 and 8. Remember, Hebrews quotes the Old Testament more, more than any other New Testament book. And so if you're keeping track, you write down Psalm 40 there in your scripture journal. Psalm 40. He says, when Christ came into the world, he said, and he attributes this psalm to Jesus. I love that. I love that he's saying the Holy Spirit is speaking of Christ. Okay. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. And when he said above... You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices, offerings, and burnt offerings, and sin offerings, those that are offered according to the law. See, he's he's given his commentary on the text. then, Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first order in order to establish the second. The first being the old covenant, the first covenant. He does away with that in order to establish the second, the new covenant that we've already talked about in the last few chapters. He does it to that. And verse 10, and by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, it's really interesting. So he's using this psalm to say the old is gone, the new has come. The old way, the old covenant is gone. It's what he's been saying for the last six chapters. He's just saying it again. The new has come, the new covenant with Jesus. And he he says that there in the text. And then he says this interesting line in verse 7. Behold, I have come to do your will. He repeats it in verse 9 when he does some commentary on that. I think that the author of Hebrews is comparing the psalm to what Jesus said in the garden. Do you remember when Jesus was kneeling in the garden and he was praying because he knew the, the tor- torment and torture that was in front of him. And he didn't want to do it this way. He didn't want to go to the cross. And he says, Father, if there's any other way, Father, if you are willing, Luke chapter 22, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I think the author of Hebrews is connecting Psalm 40 with the words of Jesus the one who truly wanted to do the will. And so he says, in saying that, Jesus set aside the old way and he instituted the new way, the new covenant. And what's the result of this? The result is this change, not just of covenant, but of identity. Because we go from being constantly reminded of our guilt to being declared holy. And we see this in verse 10. And this whole point is built on this verse, okay? So you can't miss, and I need my grammarians here, okay? The, The grammar of this is super important. He says, verse 10, and by that, we have been sanctified. By the act, the will of Jesus to say, I'll do the Father's will, I'll go to the cross. The whole gospel message that Jesus shed his blood to cover our sins through faith, we believe in that. This act of Jesus on the cross where he rose from the dead then, defeating sin and Satan, 
Like this whole gospel, he says, when you believe that, you have been sanctified. Uh, this is crazy. This is, in, in, in the grammar of the original language, this is called a perfect participle. Don't tune out on me if you hated grammar, okay? Stay with me because this is really important. A perfect participle, a perfect tense has this idea that something happened in the past and the ramifications of what happened in the past are still going on today. So it's, it's, it's not just past tense, it's past with current effects. So he's saying, in essence, you have been sanctified when you put your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and, you're st and that's still in effect. You are today sanctified. It happened then, and it's still in effect today. Now, what do you mean by, what does sanctified mean? Well, it really just means being made holy. You have been made holy when you placed your faith in Jesus, and you are still holy today. This is what theologians call the theological concept of imputation. You're like, Dave, come on. Let you're talking about grammar and now imputation. Oh, you should get excited about imputation. You have never been excited about imputation before, but you should get excited about imputation today. What is impute? The imputation means two things happen in imputation. When Jesus died on the cross, our sins are imputed to him. They're placed on him. He did not deserve it. He had no sin of his own, but in offering the sacrifice of his blood for our sins, he took and our sins are imputed on him. But it's a two-way imputation. It's not just that our sins are placed on Jesus, but in turn, in something that's completely unfair, his righteousness is imputed upon us. This is the great exchange of the gospel. You are no longer unholy sinner because that got placed on Jesus. He paid for it. What happens? You get declared his righteousness, and so you are sanctified or made holy. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ today, you are holy. You are holy. But we don't live like that, do we? See, some of you live with this constant awareness that you're not holy, this constant feeling. I don't think most of us are aware of our holiness. Most of us think and live with this mindset. We say, I'm a failure. I live with the guilt of what I've done or what I didn't do. I am a worthless piece of garbage, some of us feel. We cry out with Isaiah, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. We think, God just looks at me. We think, he just sees all the, my failure and all my inadequacy. My guilt is heaped up high, and while I know God has forgiven me, there is no way he would see this piece of garbage as holy. God, I am so far from holy. We live like that. I'm anything but that. I'm just sneaking by with a God who is probably vastly disappointed in me and is doing everything he can to hold back his wrath because he ought to squash me like a bug. I am anything but holy. That's how most of us are living our lives as Christians. And he declares to you today that is not true because the righteousness of Christ has been imputed on you. And you do not need to wallow in your guilt. You need to celebrate the holiness of Christ that has been placed upon you. It's beautiful. God says, Dave, I love you. Dave, I've given my son for you. Dave, I, I, I've given my holiness to you. Dave, when I look at you, I don't see a worthless piece of garbage. I see a radiant bride, a holy child. I see someone who now possesses my holiness. You have been 
made holy. When we wait well, we remember this. Now you say, Dave, okay, I get it. I get it. I get the point. Imputation. I'm all excited about imputation now. But listen, not amputation, that's different. Imputation. But, but listen, Dave, okay, uh, I, I just don't feel it. Like, how can I be holy? Because I know what I did this morning, and I know what I did yesterday. I, how can I be holy? And, well, I would argue today there's a dis- difference between positional sanctification and the process of sanctification. There's a difference between positional holiness and the process of becoming holy. And you are doing both simultaneously. You are holy and you are becoming holy. And that takes us to our third point in the text. Are you waiting in guilt? No, I hope not. If you are, stop wallowing. Secondly, are you waiting as one who is holy? I hope so. And thirdly, are you waiting as one who is being made holy? Do you see the grammar difference? One who has been made holy and one who is being made holy. I'm going to show you where I get this in the text. Look at verse 11 with me. This is just, again, I am just keep getting excited about imputation. But here we go. All right. Verse 11. And every priest stands at his daily service offering repeatedly the same sacrifice which can never take away sins. He's just repeating this, okay? But when Christ has offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God where he is today, waiting, there's our waiting word, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. This is Psalm 110. It's the fourth time he's used that in Hebrews. Jesus is waiting in heaven for the time where he returns and he puts all his enemies under his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time. Okay, just stop for a minute. He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Oh, again, grammar. I'm going to get excited about this. But here's the author's flow of thought, okay? Okay. Jesus instituted the new covenant. It's better because his sacrifice is one for all. It didn't need to be repeated. And the children of the new covenant are better because they are holy. So you don't need a priest to repeatedly make you holy. You are in Christ and you already are holy. Wait with that knowledge firmly entrenched. That's where he's gone. Now he's going to say this, okay? Jesus made this offering once for all. Then he sat down. He's waiting to completely defeat Satan and reign on this earth. And then he says in verse 14, these phrases are so important. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time. Okay, that's what we just said in point two. He has done it. There's your perfect tense again. He has perfected you already and the effects are going on today. But then he makes a small change in his grammar. In the last half of verse 14, 14, he says, He has perfected, past, running forward, those who are being sanctified. Present tense, ongoing process, ongoing action. So which is it? Are you perfect or are you being made perfect? Are you holy or are you being made holy? Which one is it? You keep changing your words, author of Hebrews. What are you doing? And he's highlighting something that we talk about over and over and over and over and over and over again. As evangelicals who love the word of God, we say, the already, not yet. You are already holy, and yet you are not yet. You are being made holy. Oh, what? How how do I describe this process of being holy and yet being made holy? Past tense. Present tense. How do, I, how do I figure this out? The best illustration I could come up with was with my kids. I use them all the time. Uh, not with my wife this time. You're off the hook. Um, so when each of my kids were born, all six of them, you know, I, I held them in my arms and, you know, I looked at them and, and you know, as a, as a dad, I'm, I'm holding this baby all swaddled up in my arms just 
you know, minutes old, and I'm looking at him or her, and like, I, you know, picking out, just noticing all the little things about their face and his or her ears, and just all the little things, and I'm trying to figure out if it looks like me or Clarissa right away, you know, like, which one does it look like? Some of them just look like aliens, that's just the way it is, and uh, don't tell them I said that, but anyway, uh, you're, here's one thing I knew. This was a Brooks kid. Instantly. This is a Brooks kid. This is my kid, and this is a Brooks kid. Now, positionally, that child is fully entrenched as a Brooks child. There is nothing that child can undo do to undo the Brooks childness. Oh. But that didn't mean I stopped parenting. Well, You've arrived. You're a Brooks child. You know, like, I'm out. Peace out. I'm going to go watch Netflix. No. No. Why? Because I needed to teach them a Brooks way. There, there is a Brooks way that we Brookses act and live and do. I wanted them to live up to their Brooksness. <laughs> so I taught them, I disciplined them, and I helped them. The Brooks way involves loving Jesus. It involves sacrificing yourself for the benefit of others, and it involves loving the cubs, okay? Like, it's just <laughs> the Brooks way. This is what, and I, I, I did teach them this. And do they all do the Brooks way really well? No. <laughs> Some of them do not love the cubs enough. I mean, like, I'm just, you know, I will not name them, but come on. <laughs> they're growing in their Brooks wayness, but they're still Brooks. You are a child of the living God. And he has declared that you are holy. And there is a holy way to live and act. And we're all growing in this together. And so the author of Hebrews is trying to communicate a simple changing of verb forms. He's trying to communicate to us that while you wait, wait like the child of God that you are. Holy. And he says, don't be like one who isn't a child of God. Wait well. Become who you are. You are sanctified. Be sanctified. You are holy. Live like holy. Grow in holiness. How are you waiting? This takes us to my fourth point. Are you waiting like one who is forgiven? So, not wallowing in guilt knowing you have been made holy and you are becoming holy because you are forgiven. Look at the text, verse 15. We're on page uh, 40 now in your scripture journal. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, okay, and he's gonna quote Jeremiah 31 for like, I don't know, the third time maybe. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law on their hearts and write the, them on their minds. And he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. For there, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. The new covenant under Jesus is better. One sacrifice for all and you are and when we come to the Lord's table together, like we did this morning, for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus, you are forgiven. We don't need to try to magically turn this juice into the blood of Jesus to pour it out again, to re-sacrifice him again. He sacrificed once for all. And what this means is that you and I are given in Christ. And I don't deserve that. I've been forgiven because my sin was imputed on Jesus. And I've been declared holy because his righteousness was imputed on me. And I don't deserve any of that. But I want to live like that. So when we say we're bringing people together to live, love, and give like Jesus, we're saying as those who are holy children of God, we want to become who we are. We want to live like Jesus. We want to love the things he loves. We want to give our lives away like Jesus did. 
Because that's what it means to be a God child, a child of the living God. And that is how we wait as those who are forgiven, those who are holy, those who are becoming holy. This is how you should be waiting. So I want to ask you today, let's put it all together. How are you waiting for Jesus to return? Are you waiting well? Stop beating yourself up. You are holy. Embrace the forgiveness you have. Keep working. Don't stop because you are being made holy. And then breathe deep because he forgave it all. All of it. I think many of us get confused in how we wait. We sit here. We know we're sinners. We do stuff, though, all the time that we feel guilty about. I mean, like, the, just the, th- the way you treat your family, wives, the way you treat your husbands, husbands, the way you treat your wives, parents, the way you treat your kids, kids, the way you treat your parents. Like, and we know, like that, will, and we just feel guilty. The lustful thoughts that we dwell on over and over again, the addiction, the anger, the gossiping, the cheating, the drinking, that thing we feel guilty about, and our conscience burns against us. And so, oftentimes I think this is what it looks like for Christians who are not waiting well. We confess our sins, and we work harder at sanctification, and then we fail again, and we confess our sins, and we try again, and when we fail again, and then we get angry with ourselves, and and we try again, and this process repeats had nauseam, and then we make a mistake. And the mistake we make is one day we get so tired of this being sanctified process that we stop working at it. We just start to believe we can't ever win. We just start to live with the guilt. We quit trying. We start to believe we'll never be sanctified. We'll start to believe that we're not holy We're not sanctified. And then this subtle thought comes into our mind that says, I'm probably not worth forgiving. And then we start to believe this. How could God ever forgive me? And then if we do this long enough, we start to think this. I could never be forgiven. And we wait poorly. Because we gave up. If that's you, I just need you today to stop this lie immediately. And I need you to hear what the author of Hebrews tells you. You are forgiven. You are. You are in the process of becoming holy because you already are. And so don't quit. Don't give up. Your sins, all of them, were placed on Jesus because the God of the universe loves you and he accepts you and he says, I want your sin, I'll take it. And I'll give you my righteousness. And you are holy. So become what you are. That's how we should wait. That's how we should wait for the return of Christ. Not like wasting our time in a waiting room but actively knowing who you are and embracing the continual life of transformation. Now, next week, I'm not going to steal from Mike's sermon, but I, want, I gave him a text that I was mad at myself for giving him because I really want to preach this one next time. He got a good one. <laughs> but listen, I'm going to give you the first sentence of what you're I'm going to tee Mike up here, okay? Put it on a tee. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places of Jesus, because you're holy, you can walk right in to the holy place of Jesus, and then Mike's going to tell us all about what we do when we have the confidence to do that. And that's exciting stuff. Because when we wait well, we remember that God has made us holy. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you gave your blood for us. Thank you that you took and imputed our guilt on you and that you gave us and imputed your righteousness to us. We are holy 
and help us live like the forgiven who are becoming holy. We look forward to your return, Jesus, because we know who we are. Come, Lord Jesus. It's in the precious name of Christ we pray. Amen.